Right on. Uncle, yeah. Mm. Kill him. Ladies and gentlemen, Leon Gerzing. That's me. So we had two bags of grass, 75 pellets of mescaline, five sheets of high-powered blotter acid, salt shaker full of cocaine, a whole galaxy of multicolored uppers, downers, screamers, laughers. And uh, as Jerry packed the first bowl and he handed it to me, I uh, sparked it up and I inhaled a deliciously large uh, plume of marijuana smoke. And as I blew it back into his smiling face, I said, let's ship some fucking software. I'm Leon. Uh, I'm a single dad. I do a lot of coding. I work for a company called New Context. Uh, it used to be called Edge Case. And I also ship mobile software on the side under uh, No Spoon. If any of that is of any interest to you, then uh, holler at your boy. Uh, so just a, a little level setting here at the front is that uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, is stuff that not a lot of people want to measure. So it's a lot of conjecture in here. Uh, so if you want to argue about it, uh, you, that's totally fine and very appropriate. So, uh, and this is a true and utterly infallible statistic. <laughs> you heard? Uh, so <laughs> so uh, when I start talking about this, this, this uh, particular talk is, uh, you know, it's a much longer form, so I'm going to jam it into 20 minutes. But what's interesting is the context. So... Uh, uh, what I'm interested in is, uh, is how you take uh, common idioms that have been that become what we consider to be the natural way, the definitive path, the dominant culture, that which we accept as a culture, and uh, what we can glean from, learn, and pull from subcultures, fringe cultures, and of course countercultures. Now, fringe is way, way out there, and usually it's so batshit crazy that uh, it's very hard to assimilate anything from there. Uh, but it's fun to go visit, right? So uh, make sure you go check that out. Uh, subcultures tend to be microcultures that actually live and coexist with the dominant culture. Uh, maybe there are a few bits here and there that they, they still like about the dominant culture. They can kind of react to. They can uh, interop with. Uh, but they kind of have a different take on what is perceived as normal. And there seems to be a nice symbiosis between the subculture and the dominant culture. Now, the difference between the subculture and the counterculture is pretty much attitude, right? So it also coexists, but it exists in a different way, almost as a combative way or as a well, counter version of the dominant culture. So a uh, pretty definitive, uh, oh, yes, and I must also mention, uh, thank you, Brother uh, Frank, uh, is that we all wear a uniform. So no matter how different you think you are, of course, you're going to fall into some subset of a group somewhere, and that's okay, right? So, uh, yes, celebrate your individuality, and uh, know when you're enjoying your uh, unique flower that is you. Uh, <laughs> but also remember that we do all, in fact, wear a uniform. So, I'll talk about this particular idiom in the context of process. So, for a very long time, Waterfall was the dominant culture uh, way the enterprise, large enterprise, and even as smaller ones would come on, they'd say, all right, it's got to go through this design phase, trickle on down here to the dev phase, trickle on down to the legal team, trickle on down to this other team. Oh, we fucked it up. Send it all the way back to the top and do it all over again, right? Is all common knowledge? Yeah. Yes, I thought so. All right, so a bunch of hippies got together and decided, man, let's take all that apart. And we're going to distill it down to the coolest stuff, man. And we're going to talk about four concepts. And it's going to be a total philosophy. And people will be free to do whatever they like. And it'll be a beautiful world. And we'll all communicate. And it'll be amazing. And then the dominant culture eventually goes and consumes that counterculture. Because that counterculture is successful. Right? And they say, wow, they must be onto something. But I don't think we could get away with letting people do whatever they want. So we are going to start stamping out some uniformity to it. And we're seeing this in Agile now. So everybody know who's on the left? Yes. Gary Oldman, right? <laughs> so we got Sid and Nancy over here. And then, of course, Punk is dead. And we got what we call Punk today, right? So it may not be dead. You just have to search for it. 
But what we would assume and what some people will come into as identifying as a particular thing that actually had some roots in some historical context that made sense at the time is washed away. And then what they experience as a particular philosophy or idiom is completely different than why it came to be. The dominant culture, because of need, that created the subculture, came back to the subculture of the counterculture and took it back, but turned it into something else. Knowledge without application is worthless. If you just take the knowledge and you don't get the wisdom, you leave a lot out of the equation, yes? Or you do this, right? Familiar with cargo building. Yeah, I'm sure that plane flies really well, doesn't it? So we look at what I see in a lot of enterprises and a lot of small groups today where we're relying on what we call agile or what my friend Baker likes to call agile with a little a or what I heard today from, uh, from the Walker uh, Wisconsin Ranger over here, uh, scrum butt. We do scrum butt, something else, uh, or scrummer fall, I've heard. And there's an overemphasis on certifications, on a dictated path, on a well-worn and tried methodology for success. We increase our standardizations. We increase our process. We communicate less, and we cover our own asses. There is more and more noise and less and less signal. You still call it agile, but the manifesto's four principles simply get obfuscated and lost. This is a danger when the dominant culture takes over the idioms, they gapes the motions of the subculture, but takes none of the wisdom along for the ride. And when you see this, it's up to you how you want to respond to it. Some folks will tell me, Leon, well, that's reality. That's the way it is. And I say, really? That's your reality. What are you going to do about it? The simulacrum is never that which conceals truth. It is the truth that conceals there is none. The simulacrum is true. You can defy any reality that is put forth before you that you do not agree with. It doesn't make sense. This is how we got some of the best things we did out of this community. This is one of the things that drew me to Ruby. This is one of the things that drew me to all of the other crazy languages and platforms and communities that I like to go play with. Is the fact that we've got a lot of people in a dominant culture saying that this is what is right. This is what is correct. And if I don't agree with it, I can either stay and fight. I can stay and work against how I feel about it. Or I can simply go find a different uniform and go play with a different subset of cats. But it is up to you to go and do it. So reality in its entirety is how you perceive it. I hope there's no light sensitive people that uh, we were hearing about earlier that might make you fall down. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Look away. I'll change it in just a second. So uh, if, uh, if it is how you perceive it, and you think of your world, and you are told constantly, and especially here in the West, right, in America, you know, you're always told, and a great Alan Watts uh, put, it, put it in a, a different way, where he would say, you would imagine going to school, and you go to kindergarten, and say you do well in kindergarten, you're going to go to first grade, you go do well in first grade, you're going to go to second, and then third, and then fourth, and you keep that up, you're going to go to high school. And when you're done with high school, you're going to go to college, and then you go to college, you're going to go maybe get your master's or your doctorate, or you're going to enter the workforce. And then once you get to the workforce, you're going to get a raise, and then you're going to get another job, and then you're going to be a manager, then you're going to be a vice president, then you're going to be a director, and then you're going to be a CEO, and then you're going to die with all the money in the world. The end. Life lived happily ever after, right? Exactly. <laughs> Amen. We know that not to be true, and yet a lot of us continue to fall into that same pattern, that same choice. So there are different ways of looking at the world. You do not have to learn the same way that everyone else does. You may not learn the same as everyone else does. Uh, this leaves people feeling impotent feeling powerless. I love this quote from Brave New World, a feeling that I've got something important to say and all the power to say it, only I don't know what it is and I can't make use of any of that power. That is terrible. Instead, I'd rather have this kid's attitude. Take over the world. It is mine. And I like to remember that there really is only one rule, that there are no rules. There is only your perception. 
There's only that which you perceive to be true to you at any given moment, and that can change at all times. So, someone might tell you the way to figure out large, complex computing problems is to read a bunch of books. <laughs> I'm going to suggest an alternative. So this here is Dennis Weir, and he wrote a great little article called The Use of LSD-25 for Computer Programming. In 1975, couldn't figure out this crazy thing he was writing in assembly, and uh, went and took a little bit of LSD, all partied all night, wrote a lot of stuff down, did a bunch of diagramming, woke up in the morning and went, wow, half of this is bullshit, but this is perfect. And it, there was nothing that anyone could have told him any other way. He had tried every other idiom, every practice, every technique that had came before him, and it didn't work. So he went off the deep end and tried something completely different, and that system was in use for 20 years. So well done. The subjective reality of others did not have to be his. Boreard has a great quote, we live in a world where there is more and more information and less and less meaning. So you can keep compiling information until you're blue in the face. You could continue to pick up ones and zeros and ones and zeros after ones and zeros, but if you don't understand why you're playing with them, then it's going to feel more and more empty. You will feel more and more like the jack of all trades and the master of none. Yes? So... Uh, you know, in fact, a side note, uh, somebody said hashish was going to be gone before my talk, and I got really excited. <laughs> and then I met him. It wasn't exactly what I was hoping for, but he's beautiful, and he gives wonderful hugs. Uh, <laughs> so, but having to meet this person, having to meet all of you, and having the, the wonderful opportunity to go out and see the world through other people's perspectives allows me the wonderful opportunity to derive more and more meaning in what I do by being able to hear and see and reconcile that against the voices that are in the same field, to see it with in tandem, in parallel, in, in complete opposite orthogonal paths, and to understand that there is no universal way to do anything. For a long time, I would listen to some of my brothers and sisters who said, Leon, if you're not doing TDD 100% of the time with 100% co-coverage, you're not a real developer. Leon, if you're not doing X, Y, and Z, you're not a real developer. That's fine. You may not perceive me as one. That does not make it true. That does not make it real. So it's incumbent upon me to share my vision as well. But perception there is reality. So if you do not feel that it is working out, it is incumbent upon you to move it forward. So one person that inspired me, probably inspired a lot of you guys and left us all in the dark, uh, was why. And I remember reading technical book after technical book after technical book and going, this is the driest thing on the planet. I got too much ADHD. I can't get past chapter two. This isn't working. And then this guy had crazy foxes yelling at the author, telling me I'm supposed to get an onion with the book. Like, I'm in, baby, let's do this. <laughs> and I haven't seen a book like it since. Now, I saw a good version, right? A good new second there, uh, learn you a Haskell for a greater good, right? Did I get that right? You know, yeah, there's my Haskell friends. And then somebody turned that over to the Erlang side, and that was pretty sexy, too. But I could count three alternative points of view in books in learning a language. And the thing that we do in a sea of people who are completely different. In a sea of people who every time I talk to them remind me how unique and special and individual each one of us is. You cannot paint us into boxes. You cannot put us into these little things. You cannot say that we are pocket protected and wearing, you know, a bandage on the glasses kind of thing. That thing is old. It's dead. It's outdated. It doesn't exist. Now, there are some of you who may subscribe to that and live that and honor it, and I bless you as well. That's wonderful. But that's not everyone. And it's up to us to remind the world that that's the case, that we are a wonderfully diverse subset of experts and individuals. And they may not look like the expert that you perceive them to be, right? Look at that. Can, I can't even, woo. 
I want to know how to do a grand jate from that kid, man. That guy knows what he's doing. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who tell me he couldn't do it. A lot of people tell me he needs to go live his life a completely different way to do the thing that he's passionate about. God, I hope that's not Photoshop. <laughs> it's like this one. You can find it anywhere, but you have to look. And sometimes it's going to be in the most crazy place. You might have to go to somewhere that you didn't think that you'd ever go to find it. But it is out there to be had. If you feel trapped in your job, if you are waiting for permission from a boss or an employer or a community or your family, you are waiting too long. You've already made the choice that you want to improve, that you want to see the world from a different point of view. You just have to understand it and go chase it and stop listening to other people telling you who you are. A common excuse I get is time, of which I'm running short on. And they'll say, uh, Leon, I want to really learn Ruby, but uh, I don't have time to do it. And I say, you're absolutely right. Leon, I want to learn how to program an airline, but I don't have time. Yes, you are absolutely right. You have all the time in the world to do whatever you want. It's up to you whether or not you decide to take it. You must find the way to get past the micro-measurement of time. At this moment in our life, we live in a time where we can measure it down beneath the nanosecond, right? We can go crazy with it. But for most of human existence, time was a completely relative construct. It was something like, I'll get you in a fortnight. It'll happen in the next season. I'll see you at dawn. I'll see you at dusk, at high noon, when the sun is in this sky when this constellation is above us. And it wasn't until a couple hundred years ago where it got a little more specific. And then another hundred, it got even more specific. And in the last 20, it's gotten ridiculously specific to the point where I'll hear somebody say, if you don't show up to work on time every day at 8.30, you can't be a productive member of society. Really? What if you work really well at night? What if you're like me and you like to be up from... Midnight to five. What if that's your most productive time? It doesn't exist. It's a notion, right? Hell, it was an hour earlier, like just the other day when I was traveling across states to get here. It doesn't exist. If you want something, you can get it. You will find the time. You have the time. If you're still drawing breath, you got all the time in the world. I love this quote from Dalai Lama. It says, man, because he sacrifices his health in order to make money, then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health. And then he's so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present. The result being that he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he's never going to die, and then he dies having never really lived. Bless you. I find this to be incredibly sad. I have seen many people, I've met many wonderful people over the years, and they all have taught me something unique. They've all allowed me to see the world in a completely different way. Even a five-minute conversation is enough to take your entire view and just move it a slight bit. Take the time that you want to be the person that you're going to be. Morality is temporary. The way that we judge things is temporary. Wisdom is permanent. Thank you, Thompson. The lessons that you learn, the lessons that you share, the lessons that you give back, those are permanent. Those don't go away. You take those everywhere. And to bring it back to code, I will leave you with something that I say a lot. That code is a living representation of who you are right now. Tomorrow... It will be different. I have yet to meet somebody who didn't show me their code without first apologizing for it. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is you're simply apologizing for being who you were when you wrote it. And that's all it is. There is no set path. There is no way to get to perfect. Perfect doesn't exist. There is only the wisdom and experience and love you carry in your heart. Code is a living representation of who you are right now. And if you want it to get better, make sure that you see the living representation of those around you everywhere you go. And carry that with you to your next conference. 
to your next conversation and share and share and share. Thank you all so very much.